Hello and welcome to Water Cooler. In this edition, we're going to try and get our heads around critical race theory, an ideology that until recently was little talked about outside university humanities departments. But CRT has now escaped from the lab and is running rampant through our civic debate, dividing people into groups according to their race in the crudest manner, assessing their worth according to the colour of their skin. The Black Lives Matter movement was, has been ruthlessly effective in spreading this ideology around the world, and the controversial ritual of taking the knee, for example, has become common in professional sport. But this humble little gesture hides a very ugly side of the Black Lives Matter ideology, which to my mind sets back the discussion about race for at least 60 years before the flowering of the civil rights reforms in the US. To help us get an understanding of CRT and why we need to resist it, I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Chavora, who teaches European and Australian history at Campion College and who previously taught the philosophy of social science and political theory at several Australian universities. Steve, welcome to Water Cooler. It's great to be here, Nick. Thanks for having me. Look, you're also the, uh, the author of a recently published book, uh, The Forgotten Menzies, the world picture of Australia's longest serving prime minister, which I see was described as a Sydney Morning Herald as one of the most anticipated books of 2021. Uh, did it live up to their expectations? I have no idea. I'm waiting for them to, re to review it. Um, but yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Certainly for me, it was the most anticipated book of 2021 because it's the only one I published this year. <laughs> we will go back to, to look at that book in some depth. You and your co-author, uh, Greg Mel Lewis, have, um, I think, really added uh, very creditably to the canon of growing canon of literature, I might say, on, on Robert Menzies. Uh, but our subject today is critical race theory. Uh, Stephen, let's start. The floor is yours. Uh, give us as succinctly as you can a summary of what critical race theory is. Critical race theory is basically the idea that Western civilization is from top to bottom in all its institutions, in its practices, in its laws, racist. Uh, why? Because it was constructed by white men uh, for white men. And so that even though it appears that there may be some progress in terms of uh, declining racism in our laws and in society, according to critical race theory, uh, there is not really any true progress at all. What happens is that racism just becomes more subtle, uh, much harder to find. And in order to find it now, you actually need uh, experts to be able to point it out to you. And those experts are critical race theorists. But this essentially the idea that uh, Western civilization is white civilization and that therefore it is by definition racist. Steve, to put it in its full horrible context, of course, critical race theory sits alongside a number of other uh, critical theories or, or cynical theories, as uh, the authors James, J uh, James Pluckrose and Helen Lindsay called it. Um, go Run through the whole gamut. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, critical race theory is an offshoot of a broader uh, theory known as, simply as critical theory. And critical theory itself actually comes out of the Marxist tradition. Marx uh, used the word critic, uh, to critique uh, uh, to essentially uh, uh, say how we look for ways in which capitalism is oppressing people in modern society. So when Marx spoke about a critical understanding of society, uh, he had a very spe specific understanding of critical in mind, that is how people are oppressed by capitalism. Now, critical theory in general sort of took that Marxist analysis, uh, how, uh, you know, for, for Marx, how the working class is oppressed by capitalism, and critical theory then applied that to other groups of people other than the working class. So it started asking, well, how does capitalism oppress women? How does capitalism oppress racial minorities, cultural minorities? How does it oppress sexual minorities? And so critical race theory comes out of a, a, a Marxist tradition and eventually was somewhat modified by postmodern but basically comes out of that critical theory tra tradition, which says, kind of like I said earlier, all of the institutions under which we live, the economic system, the legal system, uh, the education system, uh, the economy, uh, all of these are systems of oppression, 
And the job of critical theory is to find out exactly how women or certain races or sexual minorities are being oppressed by these systems. And then once you've understood how they're being oppressed, then in in a sort of revolutionary way, you have to overthrow these systems. And so that's the other aspect of critical race theory. Critical race theory says that that we are living in a systemically racist system. And so you always know that you're encountering critical race theory when you hear that term systemic racism. That's a dead giveaway that you're dealing with critical race theory. And, and, and then once you understand that you know, society is systemically racist, then the question is, well, how can we overturn this? And so kind of like in true Marxist fashion, as Marx famously said, you know, philosophers up until this point have, have believed that the, you know, the point is to understand society, but in actual fact, the point is to change it. That's a very rough paraphrase of, of a very famous comment of Marx's. And critical theory is very much like that. It's not enough to understand that society is racist. You then need to understand or figure out how to overthrow that racism. And so consequently, you get critical theory work workshops in corporations, coming into corporations and teaching workers that if you're white, you're racist and you have to uncover all the ways that you're being racist uh, to your colleagues. Uh, That's sort of very much a part of this particular book, White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, one of the the modern gurus of critical race theory. Uh, But also in schools, the the idea is that, you know, well, you know, take Australia, for example, Australia is a systemically racist society. Just take a look at the the, the, the living conditions of indigenous Australians. How can we fix that? Well, we need to generate more sympathy for the Indigenous cause. cause. So how do we do that? Well, let's bring in a whole bunch of Indigenous studies into the school curriculum uh, to um, familiarize uh, students with Indigenous cultures, familiarize them with the problems faced by Indigenous Australians, and basically get them on the activist bandwagon to try to overthrow all these conditions. So it it pervades many areas of of life, law, uh, education, um, the media, it's big, it's huge. And the ABC basically is a vehicle for all sorts of critical theories, particularly critical race theory. Let's have a think about what they mean by this word theory. Now, in, in, in classic uh, scientific, me- according to the classic scientific method, uh, we do think about theories. We think we have a theory for something, let's say it's gravity, and then we go out and test it. And if, if, it, if the theory appears to stand up, if we can't refute the theory, Uh, then that's taken uh, as an observation. Now, I think they mean something quite different here with theory because for the critical race theorists, it's not so much a theory as a dogma. So they don't have to go and test it. It's actually a firm framework that they take to be true that, that through which they view everything in the whole world. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's that's basically correct. I mean, if you were to ask them, how, why do you say society is systemically racist? They would say, well, uh, the evidence is that you have disparities between uh, whites and non-whites. Uh, the, and they would say, well, that the only possible explanation for that is racism. Uh, of course, when you really drill into these disparities, you start seeing that there are other very, very plausible explanations for them. And maybe we'll come to that later in in terms of looking at Indigenous Australians and things like that. But the the basic assumption, which is very, very contestable, is that disparities must be because of racist discrimination. There can't be anything else. A great book on this refuting that is... um, uh, disparities and discrimination, I think it's called by Thomas Sowell. But like someone like, again, uh, uh, Robin DiAngelo, whose ideas are phenomenally influential, uh, she, she, she writes this book, White Fragility, uh, and basically says, look, I'm not going to try and prove that society is systemically racist. That's just a, 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 an assumption that we should sort of really just accept. Now, on this question of, you know, how rigorous is this theory? Well, in, in some ways, it kind of has the, some of the same problems of, of Marxist theory. And, you know, Karl Popper very famously said, you know, Marxist theory is not really scientific because it can never really be falsified. You know, Karl Marx famously said that, you know, 
everything that sort of happens at the political, economic policy level is really just a manifestation of capitalists trying to keep workers low, keep them oppressed. Now, the obvious response to that has always been, well, what about, you know, worker safety laws? What about minimum wage laws passed by parliaments full of bourgeois MPs? How do you explain that? And the Marxist answer was always, oh, the only reason they pass those laws is to stop the, the workers from revolting. So, you know, you, you can never really falsify Karl Marx's claims because every advance for the working class that you can point to, the Marxists always say the same thing. That's just to stop them from revolting and overthrowing capitalism. And it's the same with sort of critical race theory, where like to, in its extreme, uh, in its extreme expressions, you know, its theorists will say there is actually no racial progress. Uh, so one of its earlier advocates, Derek Bell, an American scholar, uh, wrote, progress in American race relations is largely a mirage obscuring the fact that whites continue, consciously or unconsciously, to do all in their power to ensure their dominion and maintain their control. So according to Bell, uh, forget about you know, the abolition of slavery, forget about the abolition of segregation and, and Jim Crow laws, that's really not progress because all those are designed to do is stop African-Americans from rising up and overthrowing a systemically racist system. It can't, you can't falsify it in some ways in the same way that you couldn't falsify um, uh, Marxist theory. The best way to, to think about it is really just ask, you know, it, how plausible is that? How plausible is it that in Australia, in the US, there have been no, there's been no, racial progress made over the last 70 years. And, and that idea is just immediately implausible. Yeah, I think that's that's a part of this that, that people, I guess particularly older people, people of my age perhaps, find um, deeply irritating, if I can put it like that. I mean, we, we, um, we, uh, we've lived through a period of extraordinary social change, much of it for the better, uh, include, I mean, the Jim Crow laws that you mentioned, they were in force uh, in my childhood. I, I, was, uh, I, I, I was very conscious of what was happening with Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement and what they achieved. Uh, and yet that's, that's absolutely denied, isn't it, by critical race theories, theorists. And worse than that, uh, I think, is this reinterpretation of race. So in Martin Luther King's famous phrase, it wasn't the colour of your skin, but the content of your character uh, by which we judged your worth. Uh, but under critical race theory, it seems to me it is entirely down to the colour of your skin. And because I'm white, uh, therefore uh, I am a diminished human being compared to somebody with black skin. That's a real reversion back to the thinking of eugenics to my mind, you know, the sort of thinking that arose in the 19th century, flourished in the early 20th century, and finished up with its great denouement, the Holocaust. I mean, this, this is the thing. I mean, uh, critical race theory and, and critical theory uh, also have this other aspect to them known as identity politics. And, you know, basically the idea that first and foremost, my identity is some kind of either oppressive category, white and male, heterosexual, or my identity is some kind of victim uh, category, it could be black, uh, gay or lesbian or any other sort of uh, supposedly oppressed uh, category. Category. And of course, that leads to social tribalization, uh, which goes completely counter to liberal notions of, of, of universalism. That is, how should I understand myself? Well, first and foremost, I should understand myself as a human being endowed with dignity and inalienable rights. Second, I might understand myself as a citizen of a particular country. Uh, and then after that, there may be other there may be other things. I'm a particular religious person or something like that. But 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 critical race theory really encourages, it would encourage someone like me. And again, it's kind of Marxian in, in, in how it does it. You cannot, you can't overestimate the similarities between critical theories and, and, and good old fashioned Marxism, because for Marxism, the first thing you need to do in order to bring about the workers' revolution is, is to convince the workers that they should see themselves first and foremost, you know, not as Anglicans, not as English people, not as you know, Methodists or Catholics, but as working class. 
And the same is with critical race theory. The first thing you need to do first and foremost to racial with racial minorities is to get them to them to see themselves as an oppressed racial class to generate a kind of race consciousness uh, among them. Um, and and like to, to give you an example of, of how critical race theory will take something that seems to be fairly benign and say, well, actually, it, it's it's racism. They will look at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and, and the idea that we should just judge people on the content of their character, we should be colorblind. And they'll say, well, that sounds really nice. That sounds anti-racist, but in actual fact, it's racist. Why? Because it serves to perpetuate racial inequality between people because no longer are we allowed to say, well, because African-Americans are, are doing uh, less well in terms maybe of education or in terms of, of economics, then we, should, then we should give them special benefits to lift them out of that. Uh, they will say, we're not allowed to say that because we can only look at people as citizens and, and one citizen shouldn't get any more special benefits than another citizen. So they actually say that colorblindness, and this is through all the critical theory uh, race theory literature that color blindness actually functions to maintain disparities between races. Yes, yeah, see, this is what concerns me so much is this fatalism that creeps in. Once you decide that your whole life and your whole moral worth is decided by your skin cover, color, something you can't change. So I'm white, I'm racist, I can be nothing other than racist. Uh, you're black, you're a victim, you will always be a victim, and you will always suffer from victimhood. Uh, anything that goes wrong in your life will be, um, will be caused by that. So what happens is it's a, it's a very fatalistic view of, work, of, of life. Uh, none of us can do anything to change our destiny. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's fatalistic at the individual level and at the systemic level as well. So let me read you again a quote from Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility. This is a direct quote. She says, white identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. Um, I strive to be less white. To be less white is to be less racially oppressive. So she's right at the beginning, white identity is inherently racist. Um, now, here's a, here's a sort of one of the, the key textbooks of um, critical race theory. And this is, uh, yeah, critical race theory by two critical race theorists by Richard Delgado and, and, uh, 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 Gene Stefanovic, and they talk about, you know, quote, our system of white over color ascendancy. So they're talking about the sort of the system of America and the West in general as white over color ascendancy. It's this kind of weird racial essentialism that, as you say, Nick, says that, you know, well, if you're white, you are a racist because you are profiting from a racist system. And if you are not white, then you must be a victim because you are uh, being oppressed by this system. And, and there's no talk of, well, wait a second. Um, I don't actually consider people of a non-white you know, race inferior. Uh, and in fact, I, I go out of my way uh, you know, to make sure that you know, I'm not participating in any racism. That doesn't matter. Uh, you're white, you're benefiting from a so-called white system, therefore you're a racist. Um, a, a, great, you know, a great response to that was by that book, uh, Cynical Theories, uh, by uh, Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. And they say, and, and they're quite right about this, and we might come back to this later when we talk about Indigenous Australians, but they say, if we train young people to read insult, hostility, and prejudice into every interaction, they may increasingly see the world as hostile to them and fail to thrive in it. So if we start teaching people that, well, because you're white, you're an oppressor, because you're not white, you're oppressed, that's only going to generate a kind of hostility to one another. And among the supposedly oppressed, it's just going to generate a hostility to the society that they find themselves in. And how are they going to thrive in that? And what is that going to do for their mental health? Uh, we might, maybe we'll come back to that later, Nick. Yeah, uh, well, I will. I do want to come on to the Indigenous debate in this country and how this impacts on it. Uh, but as a means of getting there, uh, the trouble is perfectly understandable, Steve, why in the United States, they should have particular concerns about uh, uh, black and white Americans because of their history, because of their unique and uh, many extent uh, horrible history of slavery in that country, 
uh, followed by segregation. Uh, you'd, be, you'd struggle to find anybody that would defend that system. Uh, I mean, I think the great thing uh, for liberalism, for liberal democracy, is that they've emerged from that. They were able to overcome that through democratic and largely peaceful means uh, and to move to a better place. Uh, so you can understand why America has that particular obsession, but it seems to me to be very dangerous when you, you move that obsession uh, overseas to here or Britain, for instance, and say, well, uh, you know, people from the West Indies in Britain who've been settled there for 50 years or more suffer from this same oppression simply by the colour of their skin, or in, in the case of this country, our indigenous population. Do you, do you see that as, as, as a danger? Well, yeah, I do. And, and I think that gets to, to, to the real heart of why we should be really concerned about the spread of critical race theory and sort of it, it's, it's sort of it's intellectual theoretical cognates like identity politics and critical theory in general and, and what some people would call also cultural Marxism. I mean, it's, it's not just because it just happens to be uh, a misleading, misguided analysis of reality. So it's, it's not that it's in its whole, it's just false, but it's that it's really counterproductive in terms of trying to solve problems that really actually do exist. You know, I mean, critical race theory probably wouldn't be as compelling as it is, uh, particularly to the younger generation, if there weren't if there wasn't truth in the fact that there are, uh, you know, problems uh, being faced by people of of some racial minorities. Now, got to be careful, not all racial minorities. So, for example, and this is one of the problems with critical race theory, it says, you know, white oppressor, non-white oppressed. But the problem is that uh, in, in Western countries, uh, some of the, the, the races, if you like, that are doing quite well economically and socially are not white races. Um, uh, Chinese, South Koreans, uh, other sort of varieties of, of, of Asian citizens are doing economically quite well. So Indians tend economically to do quite well. Uh, some some uh, people of color from, from Africa actually wind up doing much better in America than African-Americans. So it's, it's a very simplistic analysis. But back to your point, Nick, you know, the, the most serious problem with, with critical race theory is that it, it, it sort of functions as a distraction to the true causes of the problems faced by certain racial minorities. It does it in America and it does it in Australia. And you're right, there's, there's a kind of false um, importation of critical race theory from America into Australia as though the, the issues faced by indigenous Australians are the same issues being faced by African Americans. But of course, they're completely different circumstances, completely different issues. And, and one of the problems with critical race theory is that it, it must, at the end of the day, it must, at the end of the day, explain all disparities and hardships via racism. I mean, by definition, it cannot explain it in any other way, which means that if the actual causes are not racism, but other things, then by definition, critical race theory cannot pick up on them or cannot analyze them in such a way that it becomes possible to solve them. So, you know, you know, if we take um, the, the, the question of indigenous Australians, yeah, many of whom uh, are facing huge disparities in terms of health outcomes, uh, economic outcomes, educational outcomes, uh, 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 criminality and things like that. Well, the, the critical race theory wants ultimately to say, well, this is basically a legacy of colonialism. It's a legacy of a systemically racist system, and it's ultimately because of racism. So what do we do about it? Well, we need to do, well, we need to uh, teach people not to be racist in schools. We need to bring about anti-racism programs. We can, we can probably talk later, Nick, about the impact that critical race theory is having on the education system here in Australia. Uh, we need to also give uh, Indigenous Australians Sort of, a, we need to have a treaty with them. We need to give them a kind of sovereignty, so they're no long, longer under the systemically racist system that's been established in Australia by Europeans. And these things will fix it. But the problem is that says nothing about issues that are just fairly obviously much more direct and 
may be addressable causes of the disparities faced by Indigenous Australians. For example, one of the major issues is the, the regionality of many of their communities. They live so far away from metropolitan uh, centres that it's actually very hard to get services over there for them. It's, it's very hard to find jobs for, 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 for many of these people. And this is, this is a problem faced by white Australia as well. I mean, there's always, as you know, Nick, been a debate in Australia over the the privileges that we get in cities as opposed to uh, the, the paucity of services in the regional areas. That's been a debate in Australia since colonial times, and it's something that both um, uh, blacks and whites um, have to deal with. But then there are other things, you know, endemic alcoholism in these communities. That's obviously leading to things like domestic abuse. It's obviously leading to things like uh, mental health problems, which then have their knock-on effects of many people just being unemployable uh, and physical health problems. So, mm. you know, the problem with critical race theory is not just that sort of analytically speaking, it's to a large extent just wrong and unhelpful and vague but it's actually going to be detrimental to the very people that it seeks to try to help uh, because it yeah. distracts us from the obvious and immediate causes of the maladies that they're suffering. And it makes us focus on very vague things like systemic racism, the colonial legacy, um, and just racism in general, which is a kind of a dream for, for, for bureaucrats and academics because they can talk endlessly about these things uh, but to actually solve problems, these concepts are pretty much useless. Yeah, that, that's right. You, I mean, you draw attention there to what I might call the opportunity cost in policy terms of focusing on this one factor, racism. Uh, and it, it avoids having to address some of these very, very difficult questions. I, I'd suggest that you've, you've touched on some of the easier ones to discuss about remoteness. But let, let, let's talk too about the destructive effect of welfare on lives and on communities. That's very well known. That's not a, a, a problem that's uh, unique to Indigenous communities. You can see it anywhere, anywhere in the world, that welfare becomes a trap rather than a means of assisting people through hard times. Uh, and, and we know, uh, and because we, 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 we don't have to talk about this if we're talking about some vague, you know, broad theory of race, but there are, there are violence in the communities, in some of these indigenous communities. Uh, there's violence in the family. Uh, there's dysfunctional families. There's families without a father. Uh, there's, uh, you, you, we could go on and on. I don't want to uh, uh, a label, you know, get too far into that debate, except to say, these are things which a civilised country must address. We should have addressed them better by now. We should continue to look to them. This is a sort of debate that you hear Jacinta Price bringing to Parliament as somebody, an Aboriginal woman from Central Australia, uh, when, when she comes in as a senator. We must discuss these things hard as they are. We have to find solutions hard as they might be. But every moment we're just talking in terms of racism we're avoiding the question. Yeah, and, 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 and wonderful analysts on this issue are people like Jacinta Price, but also Anthony Dillon. Uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant uh, academic uh, who's studied uh, the, the issues, particularly Indigenous health issues, very deeply. And he's a, a very strong, articulate and well-informed critic of, of, of critical race theory. And, and this tendency just to reduce all the problems faced by Indigenous Australians to racism. Uh, he, he'd be, Anthony Dillon would be a great guy to have on this program. But, mm. you know, one of the, one of the things also that, that tends to be unfortunate in, in sort of importing uh, sort of the, the race issues from America to Australia is that, again, uh, you know, people in Australia look for sensational headlines to be able to describe horrible things that are happening. And, again, that sort of, takes us down it sort of takes us down a garden path which isn't really going to help us fix things and the classic is uh the, the sort of the the figure that you know um i mean in 1991 you had the aboriginal deaths in custody royal commission review and it pointed out that 434 um aboriginal people had died in custody um and of course that that number is is brought out it's, it's, it's higher now but that number is brought out all the time to suggest there's some kind of crisis 
going on in indigenous communities that needs sort of some sort of radical redress. And ultimately what they'll say is that the, the, the radical solution to all of this is a treaty. And, and Nick, this is where we're going to be heading. Basically what, what the argument is always going to be is that these problems cannot be solved within a systemically white context. They can only be solved by indigenous Australians themselves. Sort of the, the voice in parliament is a nice start, but ultimately what is required is a treaty, which is basically sort of autonomy uh, for from uh, white society. But the problem with the, the whole deaths in custody thesis, and again, it, this way in which it kind of distracts from other serious problems, particularly fatherlessness, uh, is that what we're never told is that in that original 1991 report, it said that uh, there is no evidence that Indigenous Australians are more likely that an Indigenous Australian is more likely in custody is more likely to die than a non-Indigenous Australian. That's something we never hear about. And what we never hear is that according to a 2019 uh, report, um, in actual fact, uh, Aboriginal people in custody uh, are less likely to die than non-Aboriginal people in custody. That was a 2019 government uh, funded report. And so again, in, in this search for sort of American-esque uh, sensational headlines to make it look like Indigenous Australians are, are suffering from the same kind of uh, sort of horrible experiences that uh, Ameri African Americans are, st uh, are suffering from, according to Black Lives Matter propaganda. And it is Black Lives Matter is a total propaganda organization. What they start doing is focusing on things which just aren't really the, the problems. The, the, the problem isn't so much aboriginal deaths in custody which now on average are actually at a lower rate than non-aboriginal deaths the problems are why are indigenous australians turning to crime and that goes back to those issues that you mentioned earlier nick fatherlessness welfare dependency drug abuse um, all sorts of other forms of abuse and on the question of fatherlessness this is where sort of critical theories really fall down because on the one hand, critical gender theory and, 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 and critical theory in general wants to say that there's no ideal kind of family and the sort of mum, dad and the kids is really just a sort of uh, a Western capitalist construct. It's a kind of a form of oppression. And yet on the other hand, we know that fatherlessness leads to all sorts of social problems. And so, so, so critical theory finds it really hard to diagnose one of the major problems faced by uh, faced by racial minorities and that is fatherlessness because that would assume that to have a mum and a dad is a good thing uh, which kind of assumes the objective goodness of the nuclear family and they don't want to do that because they've been saying for decades that that's really an oppressive institution so critical race theory at the end of the day is just not going to be helpful in solving the serious problems faced by minorities in america and in australia but it's going to be really helpful uh, for propping up um, anti-racist uh, government departments. It's going to be really helpful for boosting the careers of a lot of critical race theory scholars uh, because it's sensational. It creates names. It's just not going to solve any problems. So, Steve, what worries me is we're about to head into a detailed and probably quite difficult debate about the idea of a voice to parliament, an Aboriginal voice to parliament. Uh, there are those who think that uh, we need more uh, input from Indigenous Australians into Parliament. There are others who can see problems from that, for that from a constitutional point of view, from a practical point of view. Uh, and indeed, as we were talking earlier, the, the sort of denial almost of the progress that has been made. I mean, it's 50 years this year since Neville Bonner became the first Indigenous person to enter Parliament, and there have been, have been others since, including Ken Wyatt now, Linda Burney, and, and uh, possibly you know, Jacinta Price as a Senator for the Northern Territory. Uh, so it's not as if we don't have Indigenous voices to Parliament. It's a difficult debate. The point is, I don't want to get into the debate now except to say it's a difficult one. How does this influence of Black Lives Matter and critical race theory help us or hinder us? Well, you know, central to the, the tradition of parliamentary democracy is the, is the idea that good ideas and reason 
uh, can come from any person, no matter what race they are. So a white person, a person of color, a man or a woman, a person of whatever sexuality can still actually be in touch with reasonableness, with reason, with truth. And so what they have to say might actually be a serious con and helpful contribution to the discussion and may actually lead to the, the resolution of a particular policy problem. Uh, Critical race theory, though, has a real problem with that, because critical race theory has this uh, has this doctrine. I, I'd call it called sort of it's called standpoint theory. Standpoint theory, and it's essentially the idea that our thoughts, our notions of right and wrong, rational, irrational, reasonable, unreasonable, that these are things that are largely informed by our racial place in society. And so if you're a white person um, speaking on a question of, let's say, a voice in parliament, then unfortunately, the way you think about it is going to be hopelessly corrupted by the fact that you are white and benefit from a systemically corrupt system. And therefore your voice is of little to no relevance or legitimacy in this debate. And the only voices or the most legitimate voices are the voices of, um, of people of color. Um, and that is an incredibly corrosive way about thinking, uh, about thinking about how to solve uh, policy disputes. And, and it sort of, it brings into suspicion a whole bunch of things. It brings into suspicion the, the notion of, of reason. It brings into suspicion the, the whole idea of freedom of speech. And, and critical race theory is very, very suspicious of freedom of speech in, in the same way that Karl Marx was suspicious of property rights. Because like property rights for Marx are really just a way of the rich keeping the poor oppressed. Uh, for critical race theory, free speech and, and reason are really just ways of keeping uh, of racial minorities oppressed. And so and that's why you often get, you, you hear people say, well, you know, you, you have no right to say this because you're not a person of color or you're a white person or you have um, uh, white, um, uh, white privilege. And, and you often get people saying, well, you know, as a person of color, this is my opinion as though what, what does saying pointing out your race have anything to do with the cogency or reasonableness of your opinion. And so the, the, the really pernicious effect that critical race theory and identity politics in general will have on public discourse is that it will make it very, very difficult to have a I suppose what we might call a, 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 a rational and reasonable and maybe even a civil discussion on, on, a, on, a, on a policy issue, a voice to parliament, which is gaining increasing traction. And the other part of critical race theory that's really going to be problematic is that if the voice to parliament goes to a referendum and it gets rejected, then according to critical race theory, the reason it got rejected is not because it was, say, a bad idea or because it wasn't very practical or because the problems it claimed that it was going to solve probably wouldn't be solved by it. So it's a bad means to a good end. No, the only reason it would be rejected is because of systemic racism in society. That's just more evidence that Australians hate Indigenous Australians. And again, what does that do to the mindset of Indigenous Australians? So, you know, I got... You know, Critical race theory and identity politics is such a poison to public debate that it, 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 very little good will actually come come out of any public debate uh, if, it, if it plays any kind of prominent role. And it's a poison in our schools too, isn't it? And we, we see uh, some horrible reports coming out about how this is uh, being implemented in the classroom. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's increasingly... It's it, certainly sort of left-leaning approaches to race relations are becoming increasingly predominant in schools. There's no doubt about it. Now, there's a debate going on in America right now over whether critical race theory is actually taught in schools. Uh, and, and it is. Um, or at the very least, some of its foundational premises that, you know, American society is institutionally systemically racist. Those are feeding into how they look at history, how they look at literature, even if no teacher up at the front is saying, right, this is what critical race theory is, A, B, C. It, its premises are still infusing and informing uh, the American education curricula. Uh, 
And, you know, you, you certainly get it uh, here in Australia, certainly in the universities. So, you know, uh, a very well-known uh, study done a couple of years ago by the Institute uh, of Public Affairs. And they, they looked at... Um, they looked at 1,181 subjects offered in the universities, and in, in, in I think the, the humanities departments. And what they found is that the most common themes to be found in them was number one, identity politics. At 572 subjects contained identity politics. Number two, critical race theory, 380 of those subjects, and three, gender and, and critical gender. So, you know, what, you know, around about sort of 80% of subjects they found to be infused with identity politics and critical race theory. And that cannot but filter in to the high schools and the primary schools, because of course, these universities are the people who are training future academics, uh, and they're also training the teachers. And, you know, uh, one thing I noticed is that lately, I've been writing uh, a submission to ACARA, the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority on the on their proposed uh, changes to the federal uh, to the um, national curriculum. And one thing I noticed looking through the history uh, section is that there is a there is an overwhelming emphasis on Indigenous Australians and the experience of Indigenous Australians. Most of it extremely negative. Now I'm not I'm not saying that the history of Indigenous Australians since since um settlement has been has has been overwhelmingly good. I'm not saying that at all. But the amount of time being spent teaching students about racism, about genocide, about uh, exclusion from civic rights, you can't help but think that what the what the drafters of this curriculum review are trying to do is basically to convince students that Indigenous Australians are basically, for the, for the most part, victims of Australian history to make students sympathetic to certain causes that they're going to be pushing soon, which are, yeah, the voice in parliament and a treaty. I mean, just the, the disproportionate amount of, of time spent on Indigenous Australia in the, uh, and, and, and on non-Western civilizations in the draft curriculum, it, it's, really quite, uh, it's really quite remarkable. The other thing I, I, I looked at was I, I, I sort of went to the, uh, the New South Wales Edu Education Department website and uh, to look for, uh, I looked for sort of resources that teachers could find on teaching anti-racism in schools. Now, anti-racism itself is a critical race theory term. It's not enough just not to be a racist. You have to be anti-racist. Uh, but that's, a, that's a, a story for another time, maybe. And what I found was a link to a website called racismnoway.com. And this is linked from uh, the education.newsouthwales.au website. And at the bottom of, of, the, of this racismnoway.com website, which teachers and students can access, you'll find classical critical race theory terms at, uh, uh, that you can click into and learn about. So you'll find institutional racism, which is a synonym for systemic racism. You'll find that in this website. Students can learn about unconscious bias. That is, uh, if you're a white person, you suffer from unconscious white bias. So you can learn about that. Uh, the other term that you can click onto is white privilege, something that apparently all white people have, all people according to critical race theory have white privilege. Even if you are an impoverished white person living on the streets, you still have white privilege. Another thing that you'll find in, in this website, Racism No Way, which is linked to New South Wales Schools website, is uh, discussions on hate speech. And what do they mean by hate speech? Well, it's, it's incredibly broad what they mean. It's very, very vague. But basically, any speech that might perpetuate what they consider to be racism. Uh, so it's definitely informing, I, I do believe it's informing the minds of those shaping our school curriculum by placing an, just an inordinate emphasis on the experience of Indigenous Australians at the cost of other very important things that are worth studying in Australia, but also in, in terms of importing classic critical race theory terms into websites that are supposed to be teaching teachers and students about how to think about racism. And if you were to click into racism, no way, you'd basically learn that if you're a white person, you, 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 you benefit from from systemic racism, you have unconscious bias, you have white privilege, and you better not say anything that could be construed as hate speech.
Okay, Steve. Now I, I'm going to address you here as Doctor Chirora, uh, having having diagnosed Doctor, having diagnosed this uh, this disease uh, so clearly and comprehensively. It now behoves you to tell us what the remedy is. Yeah, well, I mean, the remedy is to first be able to recognize it. And look, it's only going to be probably a minority of people who are going to do a lot to try to sort of uh, stave off the influence of critical race theory. But essentially, the, the good news about all of this is that the upcoming generation, the Zoomers, Gen Z, they are avid podcast listeners, are avid YouTube watchers. And the fantastic news is that there are resources available to counter this kind of ideology that you just could not have found anywhere, say, tw 20 years ago. Um, now, when I went through school in high school in the 1990s, the books that you had were basically what you could find on the on the school library shelf and what you could find in the local library. There was no Amazon. So what what the teachers ordered for the library, that was it. And so the ability to be able to actually question what the teachers said was almost negligible. But nowadays, you've got incredibly uh, popular uh, podcasts and, and, and vlogs of people like in, in America, Ben Shapiro. Uh, you've got Jordan Peterson. These people are incredibly popular in Australia. We've got John Anderson's absolutely stellar uh, discussions. And he often talks about issues relating to critical race theory. He's a fantastic source of information. So there's a ton of information out there that's readily accessible to young people that they can watch and actually be able to sort of put up their hand in class and say, oh, well, wait a second, when you say, you know, Australia is systemically racist, um, what do you mean by that? Because, you know, we know that, for example, all Indigenous Australians have the vote now. You know, at one, at one point in time, a lot of them didn't. Now they don't. Doesn't that show some progress? So it'll teach them how to think more for themselves and outside of the critical race theory box. And look, the other thing is that, you know, we, we, we need to sort of be active citizens in this. And one great place to start is for people to lodge submissions to the, the ACARA education curriculum review and, and just point out, hey, um, A, Western civilization is really just an option to be studied in this proposed curriculum, it sh whereas it should be central. And B, there's a, an inordinate um, amount of representation of non-Western cultures and how they've been oppressed by the West and especially how Aboriginal Australians have been oppressed by white. How is that a balanced view of history? And how is that a balanced view of Australian history? So there are plenty of resources out there to understand what's going on. And we've also got opportunities to be able to speak out and, and uh, raise our voices about this sort of thing. And I'm actually, I'm actually, believe it or not, Nick, I'm actually very optimistic that a lot of this stuff is going to be called out in a way that it was very hard to call it out 20 years ago. Why? Because we've got, you know, the internet, which the kids watch, we've got shows like yours, Nick, and lots of other shows. And um, I, I think in actual fact, you're going to see over time, a lot of pushback. Steve, we love a redemptive ending to these shows. Thank you very much for pointing the way through and for joining us on Water Cooler today. It's been great, Nick. Thanks for having me on. That was Steve Javora joining us on the on to talk about critical race theory or CRT as it's called. If you've enjoyed this discussion and you'd like us to do more, then we will. We'll do all we can, but we need your help. You can help us by subscribing to the Menzies Research Centre from just ten dollars a month. Go to menziesrc.org slash subscribe, menziesrc.org slash subscribe. For the Menzies Research Centre, I'm Nick Cater. <laughs>